there were many types of prophets in ancient Israel. Most of the time, most of the time, they would reveal to the people what God wanted them to do in the moment, how to live in the moment in a godly fashion. They weren't generally predicting the future, but there would be moments in which a prophet's mind and heart would be open to see into eternity and a glimpse, get a glimpse of something beyond time and space. And that was the case in today's first reading with Daniel. He sees the Father in all of his glory, surrounded by angels and the elect, and then he sees the Son of Man coming that would draw people from every nation, every language, the corners of the earth, back to God. And we see that in the very person of Jesus Christ. And Daniel describes this being as the Son of Man, and that's precisely the title Jesus takes to himself. And he uses it over and over in the gospel. There's a reference to it in Ezekiel as well. The ancient wisdom revealed to the prophets of Israel. Most of their moral teaching had to do with taking care of the weak, the widow, the orphan, the stranger in the midst of the people. But every now and then they gave people a glimpse into what the future would hold. Now Peter, writes about this extraordinary experience he that James and John had of going up a mountain with Jesus and seeing his real identity manifest to them. Now it's interesting, he didn't take up all the apostles, just these three. All the apostles were apostles, but each would follow a, a different path than the others. Their calling within a calling would be varied. Now, at a certain point, Peter was called the rock upon which I'm going to build the church, a very special calling, a way of service. That's how he got his name, Peter, changed from Simon. Now, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were ambitious. When they still were thinking of the kingdom of God in material terms, uh, they said to Jesus, why don't you have us sit one at your right and one at your left hand? And in one of the Gospels, they have their mother ask that request. And all the other apostles get mad at them because they all wanted that position. <laughs> but something interesting unfolded. They would receive a very special place in the kingdom. James would be the first to receive the crown of martyrdom the first to die for being a disciple, apostle of Jesus. What a special place in the kingdom of God. Now, John would be the only one that would not receive the crown of martyrdom. All the other apostles would receive that special crown, dying for their faith, having lived for their faith. But John had something else very special, he went up a different mountain, different from the one of the transfiguration. John went up the mountain of Calvary to comfort and strengthen Mary, and Mary to strengthen and comfort him. And as a result, he received one of the greatest privileges in the history of salvation. Jesus commissioned him to adopt Mary as his mother, and he challenged Mary to take John as her son. You don't get any higher in the kingdom than that. So their vocations were distinct from one another, but both critically important in the history of salvation. Now in the church, everyone that's baptized is called to become a saint, to be holy, to be a hero in the kingdom, everyone. Sometimes we think that's only for priests, brothers, nuns, uh, bishops, but it's for everyone. But within that great church of ours, there are so many paths. 
And certainly the consecrated ways of life are very important. Priests, deacons, brothers, nuns, sisters, they have a special role to play, strengthening the kingdom of God, making God real on earth. But there are many other ways as well. In the secular institutes or the aggregated institutes that are joined to various branches of the church. People who take their baptismal promises so profoundly that they want to make the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and in our case, faithfulness to the Pope in a special way. Now this is a gift and a challenge, a burden and a joy. In the Pauline family, we have numerous branches. There's 10 altogether. But amongst lay people, there's the Holy Family Institute, where married individuals or couples take the vows of poverty and chastity according to their state in life and obedience. There's the Institute of the Annunciation, where single women in the world take the similar vows, but in their case, chastity embraces celibacy. And then there's the Institute of St. Gabriel, the Archangel, for single men in the world. And we're going to be renewing the vows of one such man today, Paul Brenner, in our liturgy, where he'll be taking these vows for two years. Now, when you follow this type of path, there's a whole formation program that builds on the baptismal commitment of every individual. There's one year of uh, postulancy where you read about our prayer life, our spirituality, the heroes in the midst of the Pauline family. Then there's the novitiate where you intensify your quest for understanding and learning in your prayer life. And finally, you begin a series of taking vows for one, one, and two years, till finally you take your vows perpetually. And the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience are countercultural, as they have the kingdom of God erupt in the kingdom of this world. As Americans especially, we're addicted to freedom, but most of the time false freedom. I mean, I'll do whatever I want whenever I want. So to take a vow of obedience, what's that all about? I'll do whatever God wants, whenever God wants it. <laughs> and I'll do that within the context and structure of the church and the Pauline family. And then there is, of course, the vow of poverty. I'm gonna to try to live a simple life. I won't be striving for destitution, but I'm not gonna put material things at the heart of my earthly quest. That is countercultural in a profound way in the United States. There used to be a bump, bumper sticker that says, who dies with the mo most toys wins. <laughs> no, <laughs> just the opposite is true because we give up all those material things and when we step into heaven, we'll be asked, what is our spiritual wealth that we bring with us? And of course, chastity in a world uh, that promotes promiscuity, self-indulgence, seems just, just beyond the pale. And it is from a human perspective, but from a divine perspective, it fits perfectly. Now, Jesus met Elijah and Moses on that mountaintop. Moses never entered the Holy Land. Uh, he tried, but he came up short. He could see it at a distance. But now at the invitation of Jesus, his feet touched down on that sacred mountain. Now Elijah, a great prophet, he was snatched up into heaven in a fiery chariot. And he never touched down on earth either until this sacred moment when Jesus invited him back to that special mountain. And they all gave a revelation to those three special apostles. Now the question is, will Jesus be transfigured in our heart? Will we allow the great prophets of, and lawgivers of Israel to take over our minds? In fiction, they always talk about demonic possession. 
but we should be concentrating on divine possession so that all of us could possess and have a love that begins in this world and teaches this world how to really live human lives and ends in eternity.